Chapter 24, Nuestra Familia's Inception. Prior to leaving C2 to go to the pre-release program in C6, me and Big Rock went over all my schooling, which included the NF's history. There were a lot of different versions I had heard over the years, but Big Rock was a longtime member and had actually been part of the history dating back to the mid-70s. This was how he explained it to me. In 1952, the Aryan Brotherhood, the ABs, were the first prison gang to evolve and organize itself with the ability to threaten the rest of the prison population. They function under a no ethnic boundary policy, basically preying on the weak and vulnerable. They did this proficiently with numbers. It didn't matter if you were black, Mexican, Asian, another race, or even a non-affiliated white. You became susceptible to being attacked and were open game to being targeted. As the majority of other inmates weren't organized and stood alone, they didn't stand a chance and became effortless victims. A few years later in 1957, an individual by the name of Luis Buff Flores from a name called the Hawaiian Gardens founded another group who began calling itself La Mexicana. This was a Hispanic prison gang which formed to protect the Hispanic inmates from other prison cliques such as the Aryan Brotherhood. Weddle Buff's vision was to bring all the street gangs in LA together to form a super gang in prison. Once La Mexicana had firmly established its presence within the prison system, a symbiotic working arrangement was established amongst them and the Aryan Brotherhood. They had full control over all the legal activities that took place within the prison system, i.e. gambling rings, extortion brackets, distribution of narcotics, etc. etc. All the same illicit activities that happen on the streets are also prevalent in prison. Over the next few years, these La Mexicana members grew in numbers and began turning their aggressions toward the non-affiliated Hispanic inmates. They began taking their personal possessions, strong arming them and taxing them under the threat of violence. Basically, you had to pay them not to assault you so you could do your time without being subjected to their inflictions. What above La Mexicana's mastermind would later change the group's title to the Mexican Mafia. However, some of the hardline members felt that this title was too closely associated with the Italian Mafia and in turn began pushing for a new name. Rudy Cheyenne Cadena, one of the group's co-founders, introduced the abbreviated name La M. Cadena was also one of the group's prestigious visionaries. The term La M, Spanish for the letter M, satisfied the hardliners but the title Mexican Mafia still remained. As the MS abusements continued, some of the non-affiliated Hispanic inmates grew tired of the MS transgressions and began banding together in Soledad State Prison. They talked about taking a stand in clandestine meetings, but the fierce reputations of the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia held them back. The group eventually grew bolder and began identifying itself as La Familia, Spanish for the family. The founders of the group were Little John from the Valley, Gonzalo Chalo Hernandez from Bakersfield, Weddle Morgan from Clanton, Freddy Gonzalez from San Diego, and Sammy from New Mexico. Little John became the group's padre, Spanish for father, and Chalo acted as his second in command. Little John and Chalo wrote guidelines for the group, but the group remained somewhat clandestine. Small pockets of the group began popping up in other prisons and small skirmishes broke out but nobody seemed to take notice that this was another group evolving. They waved these sporadic incidents off as isolated incidents, but this still became more frequent. 1965, two La Familia members were attacked and murdered in San Quentin, Philip Neri and Sonny Pena. This escalated tensions even more. On September 15, 1968, an MM member by the name of Carlos Carlitos Ortega stole a pair of state boots belonging to a La Familia member by the name of Hector Padilla and gave them to a fellow MA member by the name of Robert Robot Salas from Big Hazard in Boyle Heights. Salas wore the boots to the yard and was eventually confronted by Padilla. Salas in turn stabbed Padilla, paving the way for one of the most infamous prison stories in the two groups' histories known as the Shoe War. The following day on September 16, 1968, La Familia decided that enough was enough and launched a full-scale attack against the MA in San Quentin. This was also done in conjunction with the day landing on the Mexican Independence Day. They launched their assault in South Block's Alpine section at the final one lock. 
The full scale press resulted in seven MA members being stabbed and one killed. More deaths would have occurred, but the MA members who were being attacked began running and locking themselves in their cells. The NS fury had erupted that day and the MA was thoroughly demoralized. The bully was no longer feared and the MA's vulnerability was exposed. This was the beginning of a long-standing bloodbath and some of the main perpetrators were transferred to Chino State Prison where they began establishing this as one of their strongholds. The prison administration had actually unknowingly facilitated the war throughout the whole prison system by making those transfers. This day was now recognized as the first day La Familia took a stand against the Emmy and is honored as La Familia's anniversary, September 16, 1968. After La Familia's attack on the Emmy, its ranks and numbers began to flourish so rapidly that the California Department of Corrections began calling it the Blooming Flower. The recruitment procedures actually had to be revised and the books were closed as there were just too many members getting pulled. It became a blood fest. The MA had finally been brought to its knees and everybody who had grown tired or had suffered inflictions at their hands now wanted to become a member of La Familia. The paradox created a vast change in La Familia's recruiting procedures. Meanwhile, Cheyenne, who helped co-found the group, emerged as a prominent leader for the MA. Coincidentally, he was childhood friends with Chalo, who was one of La Familia's founders. Cheyenne embarked on a personal crusade to forge a truce with La Familia and approached Chalo with his intentions. Cheyenne, being a devout believer in his Mexican heritage, stood strongly against Mexicans killing Mexicans. He genuinely wanted to stop the conflict. It was a vision of his to bring the two groups together for the purpose of creating a super game. He wanted to create a unified, legitimate political organization similar to the Black Panther Party. Meanwhile, Robert Bobo Sosa, a decorated Vietnam War veteran from Santa Barbara, emerged as La Familia's Supreme Commander. He appointed Joe Death Row Joe Gonzalez as his second in command and together they began reorganizing the group under a paramilitary structure. Captains, lieutenants and generals were appointed. The NF's visionary criminal genius, Death Row Joe, installed the organization's foundations and drafts the group's first set of goals, objectives, and bylaws. This was called the Constitution, or La Biblia, Spanish for the Bible. They also changed the title to La Nuestra Familia. Chalo ended up getting transferred to Chino, where he still holds sway within the group, but is now an underling to Babo in his chain of command. Cheyenne, Knowing that his best chance at prevailing on a truce lies with Chalo, convinces the prison administration to transfer him there so he can make the proposition. By now, the prison administration had become desperate after seeing the level of violence and the escalation of prison murders. They agreed to transfer Cheyenne as a last ditch countercharge. When Cheyenne got to Chino, he approached Chalo about the truce. But Chalo told him that he would discuss it with Babo and Death Row Joe as they were the ones who had the authority to make the decision. Meanwhile, another up and coming member of the Emmy by the name of Joe Pegleg Morgan began plotting to sabotage Cheyenne's efforts. Morgan wanted exclusive control over the main lines in all the prisons. He had no interest in sharing this power. He looked at a truce as a form of bowing out and surrendering. Morgan also began growing tired of Cheyenne's personal indiscretions and began to view Cheyenne as a prison politician who was steadily losing sight of the MS best interests. He felt that Cheyenne's purpose had become self-serving and that he had become a fallen metal. For the sole purpose of sabotaging Cheyenne's efforts, Morgan ordered four MS soldiers to attack and stab the Arenda brothers. Gilbert Arenda and Santos Arenda were both NF members from Maravilla who were housed in another area of the prison. This was being done simultaneously during the time Cheyenne was approaching Chalo. When the Aranda brothers were stabbed, Babo and Death Row Joe assumed that Cheyenne was in on it the whole time and that his propositions about a truce was nothing more than a ploy and a deceptive divisionary tactic. Morgan's plan had worked. This resulted in Cheyenne becoming a marked man. It was decided that he had to pay for this with his life. Because of this, some would argue that Morgan's own indiscretions became the motivating force in Cheyenne's death. Cheyenne suddenly realized that his power had completely disintegrated and that he no longer held any influence in the Mexican Mafia. Although the Mexican Mafia has continued to paint Cheyenne's murder as an honorable and venerable one, 
This was simply not the case. The Emmys accounts of how Cheyenne met his death are exaggerated and embellished so as to portray Cheyenne as a staunch warrior accepting of his death. Even the storyline in the major motion picture American Meat misrepresented the facts. Cheyenne met an inglorious and ungraceful death that day. He had no idea he was about to be killed and assumed that his childhood friend Chalo wouldn't allow this to happen. The NF didn't give Cheyenne any reason to believe that he was about to meet his demise that day either. This was initiated by complete surprise. The misrepresentations come from the significant blow to the Emmys Eagle and in some ways to ameliorate the Emmys conscience that one of their highest placed members have been taken out by a group who they considered inferior or as they say by a bunch of farmers. The fact remains that the Nuestra Familia emerged as a countervailing force and whether the M.A. accepted this veracity or not, a group to be reckoned with. On December 17, 1972, Cheyenne exited his cell and was attacked with another M.A. member by the name of Bobby Zapata. Cheyenne was stabbed more than 70 times and thrown over the tier. Once Eddie Crackers Vindiola, Frank Joker Mendoza, and Juan Manzana Scalone finished stabbing him and threw him over the tier. Ray Tiny Contreras continued to stab him and eventually finished him off. By now, the M.A. began to worry that they were losing the war. Cheyenne's murder ignited a blood fest. The Nuestra Familia had tasted blood and all M.A. members now became targets. The NF's offensive action became a phenomenal inspiration throughout the entire prison system. They became the voice and a guiding light of all those that had been oppressed and tormented at the behest of the Emmy. In 1973, Babo and Death Row Joe took their vision to the streets and members who were paroling were being assigned to street crews. The purpose of these street crews was to generate money for the group and to begin siphoning money back into the prisons for the incarcerated members. This was also to be used to reinvest in drugs, weapons, and other materials that the street crews needed. The overall goal was to become self-supporting, self-sufficient, and self-solvent. In 1974, the MA attacked the African-American inmates, which effectively brought them into the war. This was done out of mere frustration. The blacks weren't interested in controlling the main lines of prison politics. They were more focused on the political prisoner movement and the inflictions they felt like they were suffering at the hands of the prison administration. However, the Emmys actions and provocations brought them into the conflict. Being that Joe Pegleg Morgan was of Hungarian descent, he was able to quickly forge an alliance with the Aryan Brotherhood. The blacks formed an alliance with the NF, escalating the war on all four fronts. Nobody was free from this war and it spread to all California's major prisons. By 1976, prison murders had become commonplace daily. The prison administration quickly realized that it was losing control of its own system and began taking steps to regain its control. Members who were identified as being affiliated with the Aryan Brotherhood, the Mexican Mafia, the Nuestra Familia, or the Black Guerrilla Family were being taken off the main lines and isolated in the SHU, segregated housing unit programs. The administration identified them as the main perpetrators of the war and thought that removing them would quell the conflict. This was known as the 1976 Validation Clampdown. In 1977, the state of California converted all indeterminate sentences to determinate amount of years. This meant that everyone was given a fixed release date with the exception of those convicted of first degree murder. The sudden change in policy released waves of NF and MA members to the streets. Almost instantly, murder rates across California skyrocketed and these two organizations began to flourish. With the majority of both MA and NF members now in the shoes, it resulted in the evolution of the Norteño and Sureño alliances. This began to materialize in 1978. Two theories have emerged as to how these alliances evolved. One is that this was a strategic move by the MA to isolate the NF's following to Northern California and to define the recruiting grounds. With the geographical line drawn across Bakersfield, it would have made logical sense with LA, San Diego, and Mexico being at the MS back. This would have given them a steady influx of Mexican immigrants to recruit from. Bakersfield was the intersector, so the NF's following would have covered from Bakersfield to the Oregon border. 
The other theory was that it just evolved like this due to some of the more influential leaders of these two groups being from Northern and Southern California at that time. Either way, the Norteño and Sureño alliances intensified the war and gave both groups more manpower to begin pushing their agendas. In 1978, Babo and his leadership were brought up on federal racketeering charges that also included a string of street-related murders. As a result, Babo passes down directives to the manpower to scale back on the murders to eschew any further residual effects on their court proceedings. But some members strongly opposed this and viewed it as an act of cowardice. Over the next couple of years, Babo begins to lose some of his influence and some members even begin calling for his impeachment. In 1980, another up-and-coming NF member by the name of Robert Black Bob Vasquez emerges as a prominent figure and begins pushing for Babo's impeachment. Aside from viewing Babo as a coward for scaling back on murders, there's also allegations of misappropriations of the group's money that was generated from the street crews. Up until this point, Babo had unabridged access to this money and maintained full control over it. There wasn't even any bookkeeping to account for how this money was being managed or expended. Meanwhile, as Babo's status continues to be disputed, Hector Copas Gallegos from Salinas, Robert Brown Bob Viramontes from Morgan Hill, and Cornelio Corny Tristan from Woodland begin drafting up the Nuestra Raza. In the early 80s, the NF realized that Hispanics from Northern California were finding themselves in the same predicament they used to be in back in the 60s. They were being obtrusively abused by the M.A. and its Sureño following, so they created this movement. At the time, it was referred to as the Northern Structure or the XIVers by the prison administration. Still in the embryonic stages, these three longtime members began writing up what would later be called the 14 bonds and the format. XIV is a signifier of the Roman numeral represented by Norteños. In 1983, the call for Bobble's impeachment had now reached a boiling point. Two factions evolved, pitting Sosa against Vasquez. Both vied for control of the group, which culminated into an internal war between the two sides. Vasquez eventually succeeded at deposing Babo and reorganized the group. Black Bob scrapped the paramilitary structure and set up a counseling system called La Tabla, the table, or La Mesa, Spanish for table. This was to avoid further corruption and to avoid delegating exclusive power to one individual member over the entire organization. Now, theoretically, everything was supposed to be done by a collective consensus. Instead of a supreme commander making decisions individually, Black Bob devised a counseling system where all major decisions would be adjudicated by a voting panel consisting of high-ranking La Mesa members. When Baba was impeached, some of his most loyal supporters, such as Death Row Joe Gonzalez, Glenn Hobo Holden, Richard Casper Castro, Rulofo Old Folks Patino, and others elected to go with him. Black Bob would later implement what was called the open door policy to give Bobo's loyalists one last chance to come back, but few if any ever returned. Bobo's tenure was a valuable learning experience. Black Bob also created a category system to grade members by rank and experience so that each member could systematically fall in line. Unlike the MA, which does not have an appointed hierarchy and operates under equal authority, the NF has a traditional pyramid organizational structure. The category system was set up under three different ranks. Category 1 members, Cat 1s, consisted of new recruits who were just coming into the organization. These members are unproven and hold no rank over any other familianos within the organization. They spend the majority of their time studying the NF constitution and undergoing other forms of intensive NF training. Category 2 members, Cat 2s, are members who have proven themselves and whose duty entails schooling the Category 1 members. They have at least five years of experience. Category 3 members, Cat 3s, are the management level. These are seasoned familianos who have continued to prove their loyalty to the organization and are held to the highest of standards. They're considered the spit and shine. Cat 3 members are also members of the OGB, the organizational governing body, and hold voting powers. 
It is from this category where members are chosen and voted in to fill higher positions, such as the GC, General Counsel, the IC, the Inner Counsel, or any of the other three high offices of generals. The group is now transformed into an organization with an organizational governing body, OGB. On January 22, 1984, Brown, Bob, Copas, and Corny finished up drafting the Nuestra Raza and it was officially introduced within the prison system. The creation of this movement was a countermeasure to stop the Sureños from victimizing the Norteños. These newly recruited members were told that the Nuestra Raza is based in these new recruited members were told that the Nuestra Raza is basically an extended branch of the Nuestra Familia and that they are subordinate to the dictates and decrees of the organization. They basically acted as lower level allied forces that carried out the Nuestra Familia's bidding. The analogy would be similar to the NF being your political leaders in Washington and the NR being the military personnel in the field. The NF created the NR to divert attention from its own illegal activities and to unite the North Annual following, enabling the entire movement to function under an organized and strict set of guidelines, similar to those that the NF functioned under itself. The NR is basically comprised of the elite North Annual believers who are the Nuestra Familia's most steadfast sympathizers. The NF originally deployed the NR in the early 80s to continue its presence and existence on the main lines as the majority of seas had been slammed down in the shoes after the 1976 clampdown. This also created a subsidiary game, providing the NF with auxiliary forces and a proven league of prospects to recruit from. This enabled the NF to pick the cream of the crop and all those that were determined to fit the NF mold. The NR members were also the soldados, the soldiers that secured the front lines and were the first ones to engage with the opposition whenever a conflict developed. They knew this and embraced it as one of their furthermost fundamental responsibilities and were taught to always accept this as an honor opposed to a sacrifice. The primary purpose and goals of their cause was methodically laid out. They were working for the betterment of the North Annual people. They were striving to attain mutual respect, social status of equality for all North Annuals, and they were to work together toward protecting and defending all North Annuals from any threats or outside opposition. Most NR members refer to the NR as the cause, the struggle, the movement, and or the elite circle. They refer to each other as loved ones, bros, hermanos, brothers, or LOs, loved ones. CDC actually began classifying this movement as Northern Structure, NS, for validation and identification purposes. But the NF adopted the title Nuestra Raza around the beginning of 1993 following a number of revisions spurned by the 1992 indictments. Founded under the umbrella of the NF framework, NR also shared the same basic philosophy and ideology as the NF. When making a commitment to the NR, all members understood that the Nuestra Familia was the supreme authority and that all NR members became automatic subordinates to any active C's. However, they were also advised that they were now above the rank of all unstructured or non-affiliated Northanials. Whenever an NR member enters the prison system, their obligations are binding until death, but they are also told that furthering a commitment to the streets is optional. However, this is a catch-22 and a complete farce. In theory, an NR member's option to function on the streets is left to each individual member and that's what they're being led to believe, but this is simply not true. If an NR member on the streets is given a directive by an NF member to participate or fulfill a specific duty, that NR member is obligated to carry out that directive or it will have an adverse effect on his status. Period. That's just the way it works. C's always retain authority over NR members and this is often abused in some of the most extreme forms. If a C orders an uncommitted NR member to assist the regiment and function at some level, that NR member cannot refuse the orders. I guarantee you that his case will fall on deaf ears should he try to justify any reasoning for not adhering to these directives. He will be ostracized and looked upon as a dishonorable member who's less than committed to the movement. Basically, when the NF has its hooks in you and you make that commitment, you're committed for life. It's just one of those unwritten rules. The same applies to murder not being a prerequisite for membership. It may not be a prerequisite technically for membership, 
but what they don't tell you is that it may be a requisite during membership. This is considered making the ultimate sacrifice. Most NR members commit to the NR as they believe in the purpose of the cause and want to be part of the establishment. However, what a lot of them fail to realize is that during the course of fulfilling exigent obligations, murder may actually become mandated, and this surely would not be debatable. The reality is that a lot of these NR members want to go home and fret over the idea of catching any more time. Some of them will lock it up for ordering them to do a hands-on removal and assault that is carried out without the use of a weapon. So one can only imagine what would happen if you ordered them to commit a murder. Not all of them, but some of them. Nonetheless, those NR members that possess leadership potential and intellectual stature were exposed to the more intensive NF training and were then selected to fulfill leadership positions. The NF wanted to allocate some measure of independence to this movement and allow them to set their own checks and balances by structuring the leaders to work together under a small counseling system. The NR was officially introduced on January 22, 1984, which became their birthday or the date that they considered as their inception. The following indictments below were also significant occurrences that took place throughout the 90s. Some of them are from personal knowledge, but others were compiled from various newspaper articles or other sources. In 1990, Joseph Pinky Hernandez, Pablo Pantera Pena, and Louis Dump Truck Chavez devised an extensive hit list comprised of NF hermits and enemies to be taken out after Chavez was released on parole. Apparently, bloodshed had sat idle for too long and the generals decided it was time to start cleaning house and putting the NF's name back on the streets. Among some of those condemned on the list in the San Jose area were James Chaco Esparza, Tony Little Weasel Herrera, and Carlos Weasel Mejia. On April 19, 1990, dump truck paroles from Tehachapi State Prison to San Jose with orders from NF Generals Joseph Pinky Hernandez and Vincent Chante Arroyo to re-establish the regiment. Pinky temporarily appointed Dump Truck as the RSD, Regimental Security Director, and specifically ordered him to keep him abreast of his progress on a weekly basis. Pinky also presses Dump Truck about eliminating the names on the list and to begin setting examples as soon as he gets his feet planted. On May 27, 1990, almost a month later, Ronald Lucky Shelton also paroles with orders to assume command of the regiment complicating who's actually in charge. However, Lucky and Dump Truck agree to work together and function with equal powers until the confusion is resolved. Weasel was apparently targeted for his role in ordering the death of a C who was killed by some young Northanials loyal to him and for several run-ins that he was having with other C's on the streets. It was also said that a close business associate of the NF by the name of Raymond Johns wanted Weasel hit for interfering with a woman that he was apparently obsessed with. Weasel stopped this woman from seeing Johns and had also ordered some young Northanials to vandalize his company that manufactured quartz stenograph machines. Raymond Johns managed to gain some influence with the NF on a business level, but he was actually tied in with the Bonanno family and had a lot of contacts with the Italian Mafia. Infuriated over Weasel's involvement with this woman, Johns put a price on Weasel's head and had the money to cover it. It's rumored that Johns wanted to use Lorenzo Lencho Guzman for the job because Lencho was a grimy dude and hard up for money. It would later come out that Johns had a penchant for finding high class call girls to murder by strangling them with expensive mail ordered lingerie. In January 1981, he was actually questioned and suspected of strangling his wife, Maureen Reddick, but authorities were unable to put a case together against him. He would later get convicted and sentenced to death for a string of these murders that turned out to be a pattern. On July 4, 1990, Victor Sleepers Escabel and Lorenzo Lencho Guzman attempt to follow through with orders to murder Weasel. After luring Weasel away from a barbecue at Kelly Park, Sleeper stabs Weasel multiple times and leaves him for dead. Believing that Weasel succumbed to his injuries, Sleepers and Lancho return 30 minutes later and mistakenly report to Cripple Jerry that Weasel has been murdered. Later, they would discover that Weasel survived and had given a full account of the incident to authorities while he lay on his deathbed. Lancho and Sleepers were quickly apprehended and Weasel agreed to cooperate against them. In September 1990, Lucky and Dump Truck attend a meeting at the home of Lisa Cuevas 
at the request of Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes, who was the RSD over the Stockton Regiment. The purpose of the meeting was to resolve the confusion over who was to act as the RSD over the San Jose Regiment. Mad Dog demotes Dump Truck to second in command and appoints Lucky to hold the position. Later that same month, on September 17, 1990, Another up-and-coming C by the name of Bobby Silent Lopez paroles and quickly plugs into the regiment. Coincidentally, all these C's began paroling within a few months of each other, making the San Jose Regiment one of the NF's strongest power bases at the time. On November 17, 1990, Lucky arranges a meeting with Silent and another C by the name of James Huevo Trujique. The purpose of this meeting was to discuss John Blanco's suspicions about Tony Little Weasel Herrera being an informant. Lucky issues a green light on Weasel, but states that he's going to personally handle the assignment to set an example as RSD. Sheldon Skip Villanueva, who was an NF lieutenant at the time, agrees to assist Lucky with the hit. However, the next day, Little Weasel provides information to the police, which ultimately leads to Skip's arrest. Little Weasel provided the information discreetly, but by now, Lucky and Silent were already convinced that he had something to do with it. The following day on November 20th, 1990, Little Weasel was shot eight times in the head and left in the middle of Wooster Avenue. On the day Little Weasel was murdered, he agreed to meet Lucky, Webble, and Silent to discuss some of the street activities he was assisting the regiment with. When Lucky, Silent, and Webble pulled up in a Chevette that belonged to a woman named Betsy Spencer, Little Weasel was told to get in the car. Once in the car, Webble pulled out a 38 caliber revolver aimed it at him and pulled the trigger twice, <laughs> but the gun supposedly jammed. Realizing that Webble had just tried to shoot him, Little Weasel got out of the car and tried to run. Silent then jumped out, ran after him and tackled him in the middle of the street. While he was still down, Lucky then walked up and shot him eight times in the head and neck. Silent is then promoted to the post of SD, security director, by Lucky and Dump Truck is then demoted again for his lack of participation in Little Weasel's murder. Silent informs Dump Truck that he's on freeze until he brings the organization a body. A few days after Little Weasel's murder, an individual by the name of Robert Fat Cal Jossel is overheard saying, Fuck Lucky. I know Lucky killed Tony. Apparently this was said at Little Weasel's funeral. Lucky ends up catching one of these comments and orders Fat Cal's murder as a lesson to others. Lucky told Silent that if he allowed Jostle to live, it would cause diminution of the NF's power and people would just not be willing to cooperate with drug transactions on a respectful level. On March 15, 1991, Lorenzo Lentro Guzman and Victor Sleepers Escabel are convicted in the stabbing of Carlos Weasel Mejia following a short trial. Lentro draws a sentence of approximately 10 years and Sleeper draws a sentence of 15 years to life. On March 23, 1990, almost a week after Lancho and Sleepers are convicted, Leonel Jose Connell receives a directive in the Santa Clara County Jail to hit Fresno Bulldog gang leader Gabriel Reaper Coronado. Connell befriends Reaper and then slashes his throat while Reaper's on the phone. This ultimately leads to Reaper's defection from the F-14 fold as he agrees to cooperate and testify against Connell. The following month, on April 15, 1991, a drug dealer by the name of Larry Vias is murdered in his garage by Lucky and Silent for what was said to be behind Larry's refusal to pay the NF 25% of the proceeds of all his narcotics transactions. However, this was just a smokescreen and an excuse by Lucky to eliminate Larry. The real reason behind Lucky killing Larry was over a woman named Sonia Loyola, who Lucky was in love with. Larry was having an affair with Sonia, and this was Lucky's way of isolating her for himself. In May 1991, Silent is arrested for violating the terms of his parole and is sent back to prison. While in prison, he appoints Jerry Cripple Jerry Salazar to fulfill his vacated position as the SD. On June 26, 1991, an NR member by the name of Elias Eli Rosas is stabbed to death for what is said to be behind him disrespecting NF leaders in prison who refused to sanction the murder of an individual who burglarized the house associated to him. The individual that Eli was attempting to have murdered was a well-respected C by the name of Pablo Pantera Peña. Panthera apparently orchestrated a home invasion style burglary on a house occupied by Eli's girlfriend's mother, 
Petra Gonzalez. Panthera and another masked gunman targeted the house looking for drugs. Eli was upset that nothing was being done about it and began openly expressing his approval on the streets. Soon after the incident, Panthera was eventually arrested and went into custody on several other charges. According to Panthera, Eli spoke to authorities about the burglary and provided several details about what happened that night. When Panthera heard that Eli spoke to the police, he began pushing the issue against Eli, asserting that he shouldn't have divulged any information about the crime. On the night Eli was murdered, Dump Truck received a phone call from Raul Roy Ribles and Timothy Timo Hernandez indicating that they knew where Eli was. Dump Truck then contacted Cripple Jerry and Eddie Flacco Vargas and got clearance to proceed with Eli's murder. Aside from allegedly snitching on Panthera, Eli was also being accused of having an affair with a female they call Weta. As it turned out, Weta was with another C who was imprisoned in the bay, Pelican Bay, that I only knew as Weta. Eli was apparently involved with Weta before he went back on a parole violation, but he kept this affair under tight wraps. When Eli went back to prison, Weta got involved with another homeboy and allowed this individual to keep all of Eli's belongings, including his car. When Eli got out and ran into Weta, he approached her and asked her to give him back all his stuff. When Weta told him that she no longer had anything that belonged to him, Eli beat her up and left her all knotted up. Later on that day, Weta got a hold of Raul Roy Ribles and told him what had happened and what Eli had done to her. Roy and another NR member by the name of Timothy Timo Hernandez, who was Roy's stepbrother, drove Weta around San Jose looking for Eli. Timo eventually ran into an individual by the name of Raymond Demon Luna and told him that Eli had fucked up for putting his hands on Weta and that he had put his hand on the wrong cookie jar this time. Timo told Demon that Eli had disrespected the sea Weta in the bay and that he was now on the BNL bad news list. Roy and Timo ended up catching Eli later on that night and stabbed him to death, raising the body count to three in the past six months. The following month in July 1991, Cripple Jerry, Carlos Cusano Mendoza, and Eddie Flaco Vargas go to an apartment with intentions to kill Alfonso Weto Urango for attempting to sell two guns belonging to the regiment. Weto attempted to trade the guns for two grams of PCP. However, the hit was apparently aborted at the very last minute. Acting under orders of silent, Flaco directed Cripple Jerry and Gusano to go to the apartment, knock on the door, and shoot Weto when he opened the door. When they knocked on the door, Weto's girlfriend, who was eight months pregnant at the time, answered the door. It was at this point that they decided to abort the hit and kill Weto at a later time. Silent continued to press the issue on Weto. However, no other attempts to kill him were ever made. Later on that same month, in July, Lucky is arrested and appoints Cripple Jerry as the acting RSD. However, a few weeks later, another C by the name of Herminio Spanquillo Cerna paroles and receives silence blessings to take over the RSD position. Cripple Jerry resumes his normal post as the regiment's HOS, head of security. On July 24, 1991, Spanquillo shoots Esteban Guzman during a drug ripoff. Guzman was targeted by Spanquillo because of his vulnerability as an independent drug dealer and also because Spanquillo suspected him of having ties to rival Sureño street gang members. Guzman was shot once in the chest with a shotgun and died at the scene. On July 25, 1991, Dump Truck gives copies of the hit list that was compiled while he was in prison along with a list of NF membership to his parole officer E.J. Allen. Dump Truck was still on freeze and feared that he might end up becoming the next victim. E.J. Allen took the hit list and passed it on to law enforcement, which began scrutinizing the NF's activity on the streets. But at this point, the investigation was still in the beginning stages. Dump Truck agrees to remain active with the regiment, despite his fears of being targeted. On July 28, 1991, Spanquillo and his brother Martin Cerna shoot Marcos Puppet Baca to death with a 22 caliber revolver at Sante Elementary School in San Jose. Baca had apparently been suspected of being an informant and giving up several people in the county jail. The following month, 
On August 26, 1991, a meeting was held at Anthony Chico Guzman's apartment where a discussion takes place on whether or not to go forward with killing Sheila Apodaca and Ray Chocolate Perez. Sheila was Silent's girlfriend, but Silent gave his blessings to have her murdered for carrying on an affair with NR member Chocolate and for threatening to implicate Silent in several murders if he didn't start treating her right. Chocolate was also accused of using heroin along with having the affair with Sheila. This was the same Chocolate that pulled me into the NR back in 1990. Silent all suspected Chocolate of talking to law enforcement and ultimately began pressing Lucky to sanction his murder. During this meeting, it was unanimously decided that both of them were to be murdered and that it would be done as soon as possible. Sheila's threat to implicate Silent in several murders was taken seriously as other C's were concerned that their roles may be exposed as well. On August 28, 1991, a hit squad locates Sheila and guns her down in the early morning hours on the east side of San Jose. On the morning of Sheila's murder, Cripple Jerry called Sheila and told her to meet him in the area of Mount Pleasant High School. Cripple Jerry then drove to the location with Spankillo and Webel and directed them to get out of the car and ambush her. Cripple Jerry stayed behind in the car. When Spankillo and Webel returned back to the car a few minutes later, Spankillo told Cripple Jerry that he shot Sheila twice in the head with a 357 caliber revolver that he had with him. A message is quickly dispatched to Silent over the phone while he's in custody in the county jail, advising him that Sheila is sleeping with the angels. However, it would later come out that jail intel had been monitoring Silent's calls and that he had begun asking people if they heard about Sheila's murder hours before she was actually even killed. A day later, on August 29, 1991, a hit squad composed of Cripple Jerry, Webel, and Cusano finalized the plot to kill Ray Chocolate Perez. Under the orders of Lucky, Chocolate is gunned down and murdered later that same day. Crippled Jerry apparently called Chocolate and arranged to meet him on the east side of San Jose. When Crippled Jerry, Gusano, and Webel pulled up, Chocolate got in the car and they drove a short distance to another location. By now, law enforcement began to take notice of the escalation of murders which all appeared to be gang related and began composing their own hit list of all those who were to be targeted in a massive indictment. Adding another element to the drama that would expedite the investigation, Joe Smiley Ramirez confides to Dump Truck that his name has been put on the hit list and that Lucky was plotting to kill him. Dump Truck was already skittish about being on freeze and after seeing all these murders, this caused him to go into hiding and separate himself from the regiment. A few days later, another C by the name of Santos Bad Boy Vernius from Corcoran and an NR member, Joey Gonzalez, finally spot Fat Cow at a nightclub and shoot him in the head. Believing that Fat Cow died in the attack, a coded message is sent to Silent and Lucky that the Fat Cow is out to pasture. Investigators working on the case and monitoring hundreds of county jail phone calls also managed to intercept a coded letter to the generals in prison advising them that Little Weasel has been murdered. The message read, Little Weasel's peddling daisies. At this point, law enforcement had finally seen enough. As they were finalizing their list of NF members and associates who were either suspects in these murders or who were part of the conspiracy, they received a blessing in October 1991. Louis Dump Truck Chavez agrees to cooperate with authorities and testify in front of an impaneled grand jury detailing all these murders and the illicit activities that the San Jose Regiment was involved in. On February 2nd, 1992, 21 New Western Familia members and associates are indicted by the Santa Clara County Grand Jury in connection to several murders and all the regiment's activities on the streets of San Jose. Those indicted were Vincent Chante Royal, Santos Bad Boy Bernias, Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes, Leano Leo Cano, Anthony Chico Guzman, Joseph Pinky Hernandez, Timothy Timo Hernandez, Bobby Silent Lopez, Alice Perez Lamlin, Carlos Cusano Mendoza, Irene Nieto, Raul Roy Rivles, Cripple Jerry, Salazar, Herminio Spanquillo Cerna, Martin Cerna, Ronald Lucky Shelton, Carmen Trinidad, James Webel Trujique, Eddie Flaco Vargas, Sheldon Skip Villanueva, and Celeste Williams. 
As a result, 1992 was actually one of the bloodiest years in the NF's history and served as a clear reminder that the NF was a ruthless organization that had no qualms about spilling blood, even when it came to their own. Bobby Silent Lopez, James Webel Trujique, Herminio Spanquillo Cerna, Jerry Cripple Jerry Salazar, and Ronald Lucky Shelton were all hit with special circumstances and faced the death penalty. However, on December 15, 1993, the case would take a shocking turn. In exchange for removing the death penalty as a possible punishment for their roles in these murders, Ronald Lucky Shelton and Jerry Cripple Jerry Salazar admit to ordering six murders in San Jose and agree to cooperate with the district attorney. They are immediately taken into protective custody by the federal authorities. On September 27, 1993, Adam Bandit Karras and Luis Olivares Jr. lure Paul Fairfan into Watson Park in San Jose and ambush him during an organized robbery. When Lucky defects, he implicates Chante as the one who ordered this murder. Chante is then charged with Fairfan's murder along with special circumstances, making him the sixth defendant held to face the death penalty. On June 2, 1994, a little over a year after the first indictment, law enforcement step up the pressure by unsealing a second wave of indictments on seven more NF members and associates. Those indicted in the second wave were Vincent Chente Arroyo, Carlos Cusano Mendoza, Adam Bandit Karras, Deborah Mendoza, Luis Oliveras Jr., Guadalupe Mary Segura, and Jeanette Alacan. Most of the defendants in the first and second indictments eventually end up agreeing to plea agreements, avoiding a jury trial. However, on March 28, 1996, almost four years after the initial indictments were handed down, the trial finally gets underway. The trial goes on for almost three months, but is suddenly postponed after taking yet another shocking turn. Seated La Mesa member and acting general, Vincent Chente Arroyo agrees to plead guilty to robbery charges and testifies on behalf of the prosecution in exchange for a 25-year term with parole eligibility after 17 years. This is a devastating setback for some of the defendants as Chente's testimony would become critical, but the trial resumes on January 12, 1997 with only four of the original 21 defendants remaining. One of the remaining, Eddie Flacco Vargas, actually began cooperating with the prosecution, but after getting caught in several lies and violating the terms of his agreement, the district attorney pulls his deal and moves forward with prosecuting him with the others. On July 14, 1997, the case finally ends in convictions of Bobby Silent Lopez, James Huevo Trujique, Herminio Spanquillo Cerna, and Eddie Flacco Vargas. The final tally places the cost of the trial at over $10 million. Eddie Flacco Vargas is sentenced on August 15, 1997 to 60 years in prison and a month later on September 13, 1997, James Huevo Trujique and Herminio Spanquillo Cerna are both sentenced to death. Bobby Silent Lopez schedules his sentencing on November 14, 1997 and is also given the death penalty capping off a six-year span of violence that would forever become a major part of the Nuestra Familia's history. During the last 30-year span, the NF had forged a unique and almost unassailable criminal organization in California, and much of its frightening power arose from an arcane legacy transported to the urban streets from inside the prison system. Neighborhoods were now being turned into xenophobic enclaves, which also became an alarming and steadily growing stigma for law enforcement.